Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 340. 340 to be in. Near, still near. Close to thy heart. Nearer, still nearer. Close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, so precious thou art. Fold me, oh, fold me close to thy breast. Shelter me safe in the haven of rest. Shelter me safe. In that haven of rest, nearer, still nearer, nothing I bring, not as an offering to Jesus, my King, only my sinful. Now, contrite heart, grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Nearer, still nearer, Lord, to be thine, sin with its follies I gladly resign. All of its pleasures, pomp and its pride, give me but Jesus, my Lord, Crucify, give me but Jesus, my Lord, crucify. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last, till safe in glory my anchor is cast. Through endless ages, ever to be, nearer my Savior, still nearer to Thee. Nearer my Savior, still nearer to Thee. For our scriptural reading, let's take our Bibles and look to Jeremiah chapter 26. I know several of us are reading through the book of Jeremiah. The Lord so directed separately, and as we've gathered talking with one another, we found in this a great blessing, clear declaration of God's sovereignty and justice and holiness yet also of mercy and of grace, all looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jeremiah, in many ways, typifies the Lord Jesus Christ as he stood against the wicked day in which he lived amongst the religious leaders of the day who, in their pride, thought themselves to be beyond judgment and even though the Lord told them that judgment was coming and that that house would be left desolate, here is the same message in Jeremiah. He would have been prophesying around 600 years before Christ. In fact, in chapter 26 here, it's talking about the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah. At this point, it's just about the end of that line of kings. First went away the 10 tribes of Israel. And now coming down to the end here, just 
In fact, about three years before the Lord would bring this judgment upon Jerusalem, and Jehoiakim was uh, actually a surrogate king that was placed there by the Egyptians. And it wasn't long after that that he himself was killed. So that's what we read here. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord. And indeed, that's how every one who stands to speak on behalf of the Lord always begins and always ends. Thus saith the Lord. Let it never be speculation or curiosity seeking please hearers thus saith the Lord and he said stand in the court of the Lord's house this would have been the outer court where was the altar of burnt offering and speak unto all the cities of Judah you say well they didn't have internet back then they didn't have email they didn't have twitter so how could jeremiah standing there in the court of the lord's house speak to all the cities of judah well the different representatives from throughout judah would come on certain feast days and it was to them that this message was commuted to go back and speak to their own and he says all the words that i command thee to speak unto them Notice, diminish not a word. Every word of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. And so we're not to skirt around words, even leaving out one word, which many times defines the whole word when it has a definite article, when it speaks of the Lord, not just a Lord. Every word is to be instructed and if so be they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way that i may repent me of the evil which i purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings now what's clear here is that the lord in his justice cannot command less than repentance that turning to him as he is and it is true in verse 3, if a man will hearken and turn from his evil way. The scriptures use human language to help us understand God. It says that I may repent me. We know God is not a man that he should repent. But here it's speaking a language that men can understand. I'll turn from what I purpose to do. And here's a message to those that say, well, I think God ought to leave the choice up to man. Well, here's an example where he says, if you can turn, then turn. I'm not keeping you from turning. It's not God that hinders. Like some people think, well, if he didn't choose you, then how on earth are you going to? Well, you're the one that wanted to have the choice anyway, so turn. Why don't you do everything the Lord commands as the law commands and see how that works for you? So even that, we preach a God that, yes, he's chosen sinners to save, but others left themselves. It's not God holding them back. You will not come, is what Christ said, that you might have eternal life. People always want to blame God for having made a divide. Well, he's chosen sinners that he's purposed to save, because he knows without him doing the choosing, none would. But the rest, have that. If you think that somehow you can satisfy God. In verse 4 it says, And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If ye will not hearken to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, then I will make this house like Shiloh, and I will make this city a curse 
to all the nations of the earth. So you can see God is a God of means, that he raises up prophets. And those prophets in preaching, just like Jeremiah, showed forth the Lord Jesus Christ who should come and forgive their debt by accomplishing the law himself. That's what it is to walk in my law. Not looking to themselves for any obedience, but looking to the Lord Jesus Christ who should come. And they set Christ forth before them. But here it says that they would not hearken. Our Lord gave a parable about this in the New Testament concerning the vineyard where he sent his servants and they killed those servants. And then when God, the father sent his son, they said, here comes the heir, let's kill him too. They would not have him to reign over them. So the priests and the prophets, verse seven, and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now, you're again specifying words. They heard that there's a hearing with the ears and there's a hearing with the heart. It's like as you set forth Christ and the gospel and his glory and God's holiness and justice in condemning sin, that if it's not condemned in the Savior, then it's the sinner that bears that condemnation. People hear these messages and they get a little shiver and concern about, am I the Lord's or am I not? But then as soon as they get up and go out, they're back to their way of thinking again. Oh, it can't be that bad. They start talking to people. Oh, it can't be that, that serious. That's the way it was with Jeremiah. <clears throat> it says, now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, <laughs> saying, thou shalt surely die. Just like our Lord Jesus Christ when he declared the glory of his father. They sought to kill him. And they said, why hast thou prophesied? This is an interesting statement. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord? Didn't Paul warn of those that would not withstand or put up with sound doctrine, having itching ears? Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying this house shall be like Shiloh, in other words, left desolate, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant. And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. That's what they did with our Lord. When he said, your house is left to you desolate, that angered them all the more. They cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Now when the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house or at the door. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people saying, this man is worthy to die. Here again, who is it that crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? It wasn't the common people. His death was plotted in the synagogues. Here's the priests and the prophets so-called. John said, many false prophets have gone out into the world, even in his day. And this man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city, as ye have heard with your ears. In their depravity, they had no concern for the glory of God and his declaration of his glory. They rather valued that city. It's like people holding on to their denomination, holding on to their traditions, holding on to their church buildings. The fact that this building has been in existence, you see that on the side of some of these places of worship since 1890 something, well, big deal. It's, a, it's nothing but a tombstone. It's nothing but a mausoleum full of dead men's bones. Then spake Jeremiah to all the princes and to all the people, saying, and this is what I find so wonderful, when the Lord has put his truth in the heart of one of his ministers, truth doesn't change. No matter how many times they open their mouth, they will not compromise the truth. 
Then spake Jeremiah to all the princes and to all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that you have heard. See, that's the part of the message of the gospel. It's a two-edged sword. There's a message of salvation in Christ, but there's also a message against everything that is opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, he says, therefore now amend your ways and, and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. This reminds me of what the Lord said to Cain, that if he does that which is good, which meant go find a sacrifice without spot, without blemish and bring it just like Abel did. He said, then you will be pardoned. But if not, what do he say? Sin lies at the door. There is no remedy for sin apart from the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's standing here in the house of the Lord where all these sacrifices are being offered. And yet they thought nothing of it. It was just a, an obligation, a tradition. But even here, as in Christ's day, they brought any kind of lamb, whatever it was. In fact, the Lord said in Malachi, he said, go offer that to your governor and see if he'll accept it. It was a charade. Like many today take this word and will interpret it every way they can, but there's no glory to Christ and his shed blood alone. So Jeremiah said, as for me, Behold, I am in your hand. And this is, again, where the Lord's grace sustains a preacher. I think of Stephen standing there as they gnashed their teeth on him. He looked heavenward. Jeremiah said, I'm in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and meek unto you. How could he say that with such confidence except for he knew his life was actually in the Lord's hand? And there wasn't going to be one thing they were going to do unto him but what God had purposed and ordained. But know ye for certain that if ye put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves. Here's the difference between Jeremiah, who was being put to death without cause, and our Lord Jesus Christ. When our Lord Jesus laid down his life, it wasn't just innocent blood that was shed. It was righteous blood. There's a difference. A blood to satisfy God's righteousness. But Jeremiah, here's a type. You bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth, the Lord has sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. Then said the princes and all the people unto the priests and to the prophets. You think of Psalm 2, where all of these had gathered against God and his anointed one. Why do the heathen rage? Well, there, here's a picture right here, the princes of all the people, the priests, the prophets, those are the ones, even in Christ's day, that plotted his death. They said, this man is not worthy to die, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. So here, you can see, as I said, in the midst of all of this, the Lord does have a witness. He does have those that he himself separates out. This man is not worthy to die, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. What made the difference? Because they're all princes and priests, prophets. Well, it's the Lord. Then rose up certain of the elders of the land and spake to all the assembly of the people, saying, Micah, the Morishite prophesied in the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one of the good kings, so-called, way back even before Jeconiah, and brought some reform. He's the one that found the law and dusted it off and caused it to be read. And it says here, this, this Micah, prophesied in his day, spake to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Isn't it interesting that these began to go back to Scripture and began to see that this was, in effect, what the Lord had announced through that Micah prophesied in the days of Hezekiah. 
and Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all of Judah put him at all to death? Did he not fear the Lord and besought the Lord, and the Lord repented him of the evil which he had pronounced against them? Thus might we procure great evil against our souls. So here again are these that the Lord is causing to reason about how they're to deal with this word of condemnation and judgment. It says in verse 20, there was also a man that prophesied in the name of the Lord, Urijah, the son of Shimei, of Kirjah Jerich, who prophesied against this city, against this land, according to all the words of Jeremiah. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. That's what we're saying here. Jeremiah wasn't coming with this on his own. These are reasoning now. Wait a minute. And when Jehoiakim the king, with all his mighty men, and all the princes heard his words, here it is, the king sought to put him to death. It says, I've said before, there's always, when the message of Christ is set forth, when the message of the Lord God is put forth, there's going to be a divide. Some get glad, some get mad. And here, the king sought to put him to death. But when Uriah heard it, he was afraid and fled and went into Egypt. And Jehoiakim, the king, sent him into Egypt, namely El Nathan, the son of Achbor, and certain men with him into Egypt. And they fetched forth Uriah out of Egypt and brought him unto Jehoiakim, the king, who slew him with the sword and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. Nevertheless, the hand of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. One thing we see here is that the Lord's will shall be done. And his servants are immortal until such time as God's place to take their life. And the Lord did preserve Jeremiah, even as Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar came down, and all this was fulfilled. Jehoiakim, the king himself, was slain and died a horrible death, and yet the Lord preserved his remnant. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for this word, how sobering it is. And uh, the very first thing that we could ask of you is to give us a hear, give us ears to hear. Cause us to read your word in that fear of the Lord, knowing that left to ourselves, we would be rebels still against your king, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, and your prophet, and your anointed one. I'm thankful that when we look around us and see all that's being propagated in your name that is falsehood, even as here, and that in no way do you bless false preaching. No <clears throat> way do you bless any word that is contrary to what's written here. That you would make us in this day to stand and to declare as you give opportunity every word written here that glorifies your name and not to turn from it, not to water it down, not to try to interpret around it so as to be palatable to men. God forbid. Grant us a spirit to know you in truth, know your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because we live in no less an evil day as that of Jeremiah. And yet here we are today as a firebrand pulled out of the fire, identifying with your blessed son who came earn and establish that righteousness which none of us could keep and did it to your satisfaction that sinners such as we might be justified, have been justified through his shed blood. For that we praise you and we ask that you continue to keep us and keep our eyes looking to you through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Well, let's take our hymn book and look to sing hymn number 263. And then we'll get to the...
message of the evening, 263. A shelter in the time of storm. Think of what we just read about Jeremiah. Shelter in the time of storm. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us be, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. O oh, rock divine, O oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. O oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Perhaps I ought to change that, oh, Jesus is the rock, not just a, he is the rock in a weary land. All right, let's take our Bibles once again and look in 1 Kings chapter 10. And my text is from verse 14 down to verse... 29, and I want to speak with you about a glorious king. Again, we see how Solomon is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, our Lord said of all the glory of Solomon, there was none more glorious in his day, and yet he says there's one more glorious that was in their presence, and that was our Lord Jesus Christ. Solomon was but a type. And even though in the Old Testament we see the glory of God revealed through the types, yet not to be compared at all to the realization, the fulfillment of all these things in Christ. But here in 1 Kings chapter 10, beginning with verse 14, and I'll read this down to verse 29, make a few comments as I read. We notice here and see here how the glory of Solomon is set forth and you can see the parallels with our Lord Jesus Christ we sing that him that goes along with the scriptures he owns the cattle on a thousand hills the wealth in every mine you think about gold and silver where men today are just scrapping through all kinds of dirt and gravel to find out who put it there it's the Lord this is his world. And so we see that here with King Solomon, the glory of his wealth. It says now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. What this is talking about is through all of his commercialization and uh, the laws that he put in place, the tariffs that he put on other kings from other lands, 
all of this was going into Solomon's treasure. Here we see a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men just act like what they have is theirs. But they wouldn't have it if the Lord didn't give it to them. And so the picture here is of these here recognizing that here in Solomon was one unlike any other king of that day. They voluntarily, willingly came and brought him gifts. It's not that he needed them. It's like with us, with regard to when the Lord touches our heart by grace, we, we recognize that everything we have is his. We're not dividing things up in the tithe and thinking, okay, 10% is the Lord, 90% is mine. No, everything we have comes from the Lord. So we see this demonstrated here with Solomon. It says in verse 15, beside that he had of the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governors of the country. So here's Israel. Here's where Solomon is seated on that throne. And yet all of these down here, when you, when you think of Arabia, think of the sons of Ishmael. That's where they settled in down there, what we know today is Saudi Arabia. And yet Solomon being put here ruled and reigned over them. He's the king of the nations. So when we talk about his glory and wealth, it's not just in terms of material things, but the wealth of the nations that lived and moved and had their being in his direction. Isn't that a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ? Nothing moves but what he has ordained. And these aren't just common, ordinary people. Notice all the way down through here how often it says the kings brought their tributes. The king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, typified here in Solomon. And King Solomon, it says, made 200 targets of beaten gold. So when you think of a target, that means something to do some target practice for shooting with arrows and whatnot. And such was his wealth that these even were made of beaten gold. That's normally people, when they make things out of gold, it's to hang somewhere in a museum and don't touch it, you know. This was part of his, they had 200 targets beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one target. I know some people try to figure out how much all of this would be worth, but in reality, it's priceless. I don't know, as you, it's, it's millions of dollars by our standard today. When you think of gold and what this would be involved. And then he made 300 shields. So you got 200 targets and then 300 shields of beaten gold. Think of those that were tasked with the talent to be able to beat this gold out. I don't, I can't imagine what it would take to melt this and to beat it and to shape it. It says three pound of gold went to one shield. It's all about a pound, it's all about a weight. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. That's where he had his, some call it summer palace up in the forest of Lebanon, but it was also an armory. So you get an idea here, what kind of glory is this? If you're an artist and you try to kind of paint a picture in your mind, what this would have looked like. It's unlike anything that we can see today in any place, but it's how the Lord purposed that Solomon should be glorified. But not only in wealth, but in honor. You see, all of this that Solomon is making here is to his honor. Who is worthy of honor other than this king that the Lord has anointed? And you can see in that a type of picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Why has all of the glory and honor been designated to Christ? Well, he's God's son. He's the anointed one. He's called the servant of his father. And before him, every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess that he is Lord. But you can see 
that all of this wealth and the building of these shields, you think of what a shield is. It's for security, it's for protection. But then again, made out of gold. <laughs> they, these would have been used in battle. These would have been used when Solomon went forth in a procession, that these would be for his protection. And so even in this, we can see a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, worthy of honor. And yet with these shields, again, there's none that could ever lay their hands on our Lord Jesus Christ. They tried, even to the point of killing him, and yet he rose again the third day, and now he's ascended on high. And the scriptures say in different places, as far as the Lord's people, that he is their shield, he is their buckler. This is one of the very first things that our Lord revealed to Abraham in Genesis 15 and verse 1. He said, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Everything in the scripture has a type and fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ, Solomon being the king, but the shield being what represents his power and his authority. That's why in Deuteronomy 33, 29, it's written, Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord. You know, if I was living in the land and worried about the enemies all around, and yet on the throne was this king in whose hand was all this wealth, visibly so, even to where kings from other countries were coming and paying him homage, wouldn't you feel safe? Wouldn't you feel secure? That'd be the place I'd want to be. And so all of this is but a type and picture, just like Abraham, the scriptures say, he saw a country, he saw a city, but not made with hands, all the while he dwelt in tents. And such is our rest, to know that we have one seated on the throne in whose hands is not only all things, but all power, all security, all protection. There's none that are in Christ's hands that will ever be lost for whom he came. And that's why Deuteronomy 33, 29 says that. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, and I trust that whenever you see the Lord, L-O-R-D, in caps there in the Old Testament, think Christ. Because that's how God has always been pleased to reveal himself. Even before Christ came in the flesh. Father, Son, and Spirit summed up in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's called here the shield of thy help. And who is the sword of thy excellency and thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. This is forward-looking in Deuteronomy 33, 29, to the, the Son of God, the work of Christ as, as the king. Here's Solomon. Who is it that established Solomon on that throne? It was God. And the same thing was said of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm 2, I have set my king on my holy hill that all the nations worship him. And so we see how Solomon is glorious in that honor as the king, typified by the shields of beaten gold. And gold, if you could take a, a message on every one of these, gold representing God himself. But in verse 18 and following, we see how glorious he is not only in the security of his people, represented by the shields, but in his authority. Here it says, moreover, the king made a great throne. This is unlike any throne that you would presume to, to find by common kings appointed by men. Every word, again, is, is vital. The king made a great throne of ivory. Ivory would have been 
from elephant tusks that his uh, merchandisers would have bought and brought and slain to get the ivory in uh, representation. Again, ivory, it's, it's a priceless commodity. I know today they've got laws and rules against hunting elephants and they say they're becoming extinct and some are, they just kill them just for the, the tusks. I have a lot of items that have been carved out of ivory in our house. We brought them back to the States from Africa back when it was still legal to do it. Now, if I were to try to put that on the internet and sell it, that, mean that, that would be a great price for that ivory, but they'd probably have the FBI at my door as soon as I did it because it's illegal, but we can look at it when you come to our house and uh, we have some of them out on, on a, in the den, but there's others still packed away. Just anything from little intricate necklaces to rings to something that is carved in the shape of a bird or an alligator and all one piece. And you can sit and look at these things all day long and just wonder at how the Lord even made, you think about a tusk in an elephant that looks rugged on that elephant, but the Lord made it. And now someone comes along and makes it and carves it. And this was to the glory of Solomon again, where it says that the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best of gold. So you try to envision what this throne would have been like as those that came to pay homage to Solomon would see, because this was his throne upon which he sat. And it's a picture of his authority. I will tell you that this is where men, they give more honor to kingly and earthly men than they do the Lord Jesus Christ, because they do not see him seated upon the throne. But a king reigns, a king rules. And there are a bunch of people out there today that profess to believe in Jesus because they made their little profession. And it saddened my heart today when I was in a nursing home enrolling some of the staff of that nursing home with some insurance. And they had put us in the chapel. <laughs> and when they walked in, sat down, there's all of this, these idolatrous symbols that were in there from stained glass windows with a supposed Jesus in there to a cross and a, somewhat a, looked like an altar. And while I was sitting there, in walked one of the chaplains and with a dear old lady that evidently was troubled. And so he sat down on the pew and he began to go through a plan of salvation with her. And it was all I could do to just sit there, because I wasn't there to intervene, but to sit there and to listen to this man talk this woman into heaven. That if she just prayed the prayer and believed that Jesus had died for her sins, because that's how they present it. They believe he died for everybody. So the only thing now is you accepted it. And then him asking her, can you, is this something you can accept? Can you accept what, what Jesus did for you? If you do, then you can be saved and I'll pray with you and that'll be it. These are men's traditions. No mention of Christ and all his glory. Think about Isaiah, when the Lord in Isaiah six revealed himself to Isaiah, he saw a throne high lifted up. And the same thing in the book of Revelation for John, when the heaven was open, what did he see? A throne in glory. And I have people that say, well, Eventually, some get to that point where they acknowledge Christ as Lord, but the most important thing is at least they recognize him as Savior. That is dumb, to put it kindly. And it's not how God teaches any of his own. The glory of a king is in his reign and in his rule and his command. And all of that's represented here in even how this throne 
was set up. It says here, the king made not just a throne, but a great throne, representative of the greatness of his office as king and his person as a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as if the ivory in and of itself was not enough, overlaid it not just with gold, and I don't know enough about gold where there's good, bad, and ugly, but here it says the best gold. And the throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round behind, so there was some kind of canopy back there over his head, and there were stays on every side on the place of the seat. This would be some kind of armrest that sat there on the throne. And two lions stood beside the stays. So you had two lions there. But then it says, and 12 lions stood there on the one side and on the other upon the six steps. So imagine what this would look like with these lions there. Well, what does a lion represent? Christ is the lion of Judah. So even in this, there's a picture of Christ and who he is. It represents strength. We talk about the king of the jungle being the lion. And so every step had six steps. So six lions on one side, six on the other. And it says, there was not the like made in any kingdom. <laughs> How do you describe the glory of Christ? As much as I attempt to in preaching him and exalting him as the king of kings and lord of lords, yet I fall far short. But I just know this was a foreshadowing. The law was a shadow of good things to come. The good things is Christ. But even here, it was not like that made in any kingdom, unique to him, to his glory and his honor. You couldn't imitate it. I'll tell you today, there's a lot of people trying to imitate the person of Christ and his work and the glory. And they, they, they're they blasphemy. Who can in any way compare Christ to anything that man does or says? And so we see his honor, not only in the shields, but in the throne, a great throne of glory that represents the Lord Jesus Christ. But thirdly, in the vessels of honor. In every house, there are vessels. That's what we read over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, vessels of honor, vessels of dishonor. Who is it that determines the placement of those vessels if it's not the king himself? All the king has to do is walk in and say, I don't want that vessel sitting on my table. Be rid of it. Throw it out. He's the king. Doesn't he have the right to do with what he will? And so here in verse 21, we read, And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold. You can't imagine the value, priceless, that those vessels that were on his table to drink from were vessels of gold. Can you see here a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ talking to the Samaritan woman where he said, draw this well, you'll be thirsty again, but if you drink of the water that I give you, you'll never thirst. So even here, not only Solomon a picture of Christ, but the very vessels of gold, which represent his divinity, and from which those who are his invited guests, no one would sit at the king's table, but what he determined they should be there. See, most people today think they can just run in and out however they want to. Come to the water, it's, it's whoever, you know, whoever thirsteth is what it says, let him come. But only those come that he's pleased to draw. And it says all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. I, can you picture, I mean, what is this representing but divinity and purity? There's nothing, there's no shadow of turning in Christ in any way. He was, he was that spotless lamb appointed of his father. And, and, and look at here, we're going to read this a little later too, but you say, well, what about silver? None were of silver. 
this gold made the silver to be as if it was just a common thing. Read that in a verse or two. The value of gold, even today, that is, I've read somewhere it's around 1,300 some dollars an ounce, and then you look at silver, that's a lot less. For whatever reason, even to this day, gold is considered to be the standard. It's supposed to be, and now we're printing money right and left. But if it all depended on what was up in Fort Knox, we'd be a whole lot poorer than, than what it shows on paper. At least, hopefully, the ink dries before they start getting it out, because it's being printed every day. That's, that's just a, a facade. Here, everything was of pure gold. None were of silver, as if silver, to have anything in silver, would not be to the honor of the king. People reason today, oh, anything will do. You know, God's forgiving, he's loving. No, there's a standard. And here it's represented by gold. That's what was throughout the temple, representing his glory. In fact, it says there, none were of silver. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. Such was the gold that was coming from all these merchants in other places that silver wouldn't even be like we consider it copper today. I actually know of a village back in the country in Africa of Ghana. You can look this up. This used to be called the Gold Coast. And for whatever reason, the Lord placed a lot of gold in that land. In fact, the explorers and everybody went there to try to get as much as they could. They fought over it. But even to this day, there are chieftains and there are elders that have more gold in their possession that has never passed hands. It's been passed down from generation to generation. And one day a year, they have a gold festival. Now, we're not talking about imitation gold. They bring out their gold. And they, you look it up on the internet, you'll see it there, but they, they wear these glasses that are all worn out of gold. You know, it's like people wear these special glasses on 4th of July and come out, you know, it's got the flag and everything. They wear gold. They, they're they laced with gold. They're the gold rings, gold thing. It's pure gold. And then when the day's done, they go put it back in their treasures and their boxes. But I don't know how much gold is represent because if you go back there and look, they're living pretty much in stark poverty. They're living in some remote areas where, but they've got the gold. And I was thinking that who are we but poverty stricken? In whose hands is this gold but the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? He is that gold, and he is all. So that anything else, no matter what man may think, even like here silver, is accounted as nothing compared to this. Gold. Any supposed riches that we think we have is accounted as nothing compared to him who is that gold. It says, For the king had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. So every three years, this navy of ships would go around to all these different, along the coast, and would pick up, purchase gold, silver, ivory, and apes, and peacocks. Now here's one thing when we're talking about the authority of the king and these vessels of honor. When you're reading here, Tarshish would actually have been a town in what we know today as Spain. Now here's King Solomon in Jerusalem, and yet his reign went all the way from Tarshish in Spain, all the way over to India, where these products would have been picked up as well, all the way down into Egypt. When you talk about a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, Solomon reigned over the then world as it existed. And all of this wealth belonged unto him to do with whatever he willed. If he wanted to make shields out of it, he wanted to make targets out of it, if he wanted to line his throne with it, such was 
his power and his authority. And so we see him glorious even in those vessels of honor. But now the third thing we see with regard to his glory is in his wisdom because here in verse 23 it says, So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. You can take and put all the wealth in the world in a fool's hand and he's going to destroy it. But here we see Solomon in wisdom, as exercising wisdom with all that belonged unto him, doing his will as he will. That's a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And it says here in verse 24, and all the earth sought to Solomon. You talk about this draw to him as the king of kings and lord of lords. I believe it's a picture of Christ too. When it says all the earth, think of, of what Christ said that the father had given a people out of every tribe, nation, and tongue for whom he was the savior and the redeemer and the justifier. And those so taught by the spirit of God seek him. Here, just like these, of all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. In Christ dwells all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We're not talking about material wealth here or earthly wisdom. But think about how when the Lord so tenders the heart of a sinner and hears of Christ, just as these heard of Solomon and saw not only his, his riches, but his, heard of his wisdom, what more do you need? And that's why they came. Nothing else mattered. Again, I can't imagine how even to begin to describe this. But I'll tell you, it's the answer when people will say to us, well, what's the big deal about Christ, Christ, Christ? You're talking about somebody there that has never had their eyes open. And I know the difference between seeing and being blind, and so do you if the Lord so taught you. Because there was a day when it would be reading this like reading an encyclopedia, but never seeing Christ, learning some facts. I've spent plenty of time and money paying professors to teach me all the historic background of these things and trying to weigh out all these things in a natural way. That, that's to miss Christ. I remember a professor one time in the book of Song of Solomon saying that there are people that try to allegorize the book of Song of Solomon as if it had something to do with Christ and his church. And his answer was that that's perverting the scriptures. I still remember him saying that. At that time, I was too dumb to, to even know the difference. I was just following along like the sheep to the slaughter. So please God. But I look back now and I go and read the book of Song of Solomon. It's everything to do with Christ and his bride. That one that one woman, you say, well, he had a lot of other, yeah, he had a harem, but there was that one that his affection was set upon. And that's a picture of Christ. But here it says they brought every man his present, those that came, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and garments and armor and spices, horses and mules, a rate year by year. So this was a continual thing. This wasn't just a, passing fad that while Solomon reigned, it was such that the Lord was drawing these from all these different places to him. We know that what we bring is nothing, but I'll tell you when God blesses you to give and then blesses you for giving, it's all of him. Our desire is to, that all honor and glory belong unto him. So we see him glorious in wisdom. And then Finally, here we see him glorious in authority. It says, And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots. Just imagine this all lined up, thousand four hundred. Twelve thousand horsemen, whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots, and with the king of Jerusalem. And the king made silver, here it is, <laughs> 
to be in Jerusalem as stones. Think about walking on a stone, pebble. It, such was this glory that even someone finds silver to think, what's that compared to the, the gold? And cedars made he to be as the sycamore tree. Sycamore trees were common every day. A cedar tree was, if a timberman looked at it, he thought this is priceless wood. And yet even cedar trees were made to be common that are in the veil for abundance. There was no lack. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yarn. The king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price. There wasn't anything that, no matter where it was found, whether in Egypt or whether it was in Arabia or wherever, there wasn't anything that didn't serve the king's purpose and glory. That he would fairly give a price and buy it for his own glory. And the chariot came up and went out of Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so for all the kings, notice this, of the Hittites. We're talking about back there in the northern part of Canaan. And for the kings of Syria, all the way even outside, did they bring them out by their means? In other words, all serving his purpose. That's why I say he's glorious in his authority. He rules and reigns over all. Much more there than what we can touch on, but I pray what we've heard brings to heart and mind just how glorious the Lord Jesus Christ is, of whom Solomon is that type. Let's take our hymn books and close with hymn number 144. 144. Heart ten thousand harps and voices sound the note of praise above. Jesus reigns and heaven rejoices. Jesus reigns, the God of love. See, he sits on yonder throne. Jesus rules the world alone. Alleluia, 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 amen. Jesus, hail, whose glory brightens all above and gives it worth. Lord of life, thy smile enlightens, cheers and charms thy saints on earth. When we think of love like thine, Lord, we own in love divine. Alleluia, 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 amen. King of glory, reign forever, thine everlasting crown. Nothing from thy love shall sever those whom thou hast made thine own. Happy objects of thy grace, destined to behold thy face. Alleluia, 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 amen. Savior, hasten thine appearing, bring, oh, bring the glorious day. When the awful summons hearing, heaven and earth shall pass away. Then with golden hearts we'll sing, glory, glory to our King. Alleluia, 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 amen. Forward to seeing you next time when we're supposed to.